Our moon could be hiding way more pockets of water than scientists used to think. Its surface has something called cold traps. Those are areas that are in permanent shadow. If you could stand near one of the moon's poles, especially the South Pole, you'd see such shadows all over the place, 15,000 square miles of them. There are tiny cold traps that are only 0.4 inches wide. And there are hundreds and thousands of bigger ones. These regions are in eternal darkness and might have even gone without the slightest ray of sunlight for billions of years. And now, scientists think they're hiding much more than we thought, including small patches of ice, no bigger than a penny. But still, something astronauts could use to drink or for their rocket fuel. The majority of the water could be stored in glass or somewhere between grains on the surface of the moon. One theory says 15,500 square miles of the lunar surface could have the capacity to store water. But no one can prove it until someone goes there in person or sends rovers that would dig under the surface. The moon is not entirely white and devoid of color. Apollo astronauts that landed there in 1969 said the moon was a bit brownish. Later studies showed some dark lunar areas display hints of brown and blue. Highland regions are yellowish, with faint traces of pale and pink. Colors are not the same everywhere because of different amounts of various metals that are present on the moon, like titanium or iron in the surface minerals. Our eyes are not sensitive enough to pick out such differences from this distance. But the majority of the lunar surface consists of minerals that are naturally gray. And that's mostly the color we see from our planet. When you're in space, you can't walk on the ground. No gravity, so no need to wear shoes. That's why astronauts mostly wear socks, or eventually add another warmer pair if they're cold. But something strange might happen to your feet while you're up there. First, if you have calluses, they may fall off after some time. One astronaut described his experience and said the bottoms of his feet became very soft, while the skin on the top of his feet became very rough, like alligator skin. He engaged the top of his feet to get around when he was using foot rails on a space station where they stay. It's not easy up there. Astronauts on the International Space Station, ISS, have to use foot rails and loops to remain steady when they have to do regular things like just getting a haircut. When they want to do training, they can strap their feet into sneakers on the exercise equipment. It's essential for them to exercise way more than they'd have to on Earth, around two hours each day, because the human body isn't used to moving or performing any actions we normally do without gravity that kind of holds us together. Plus, if you stay in space for a longer time, you can lose much of your bone and muscle mass. For example, you can lose almost 20% of your muscle mass if you spend only 11 days in zero gravity conditions. But if you were up there, there's no point in using weights, right? Zero gravity affects them, too. Instead, astronauts mostly use a device outfitted with two small canisters that create a vacuum and allow them to pull against a long bar. On the ISS, you can also use a bike and a treadmill. Did you know that NASA spent millions of dollars developing a pen that you could write with in zero gravity? A pencil is not the best solution for space travel. They have a habit of breaking and shattering, which can leave graphite dust behind. Also, they're wooden, which brings a high risk of fire in the pressurized, oxygen-rich capsule. That's why even such an everyday thing as a pencil can be life-threatening in space. So they had to develop the space pen. It writes crisp and clean and can't rely on gravity to make the ink flow. Instead, it uses compressed nitrogen to force ink out of the nozzle. This way, you can write while you're floating upside down or even submerged underwater. Even when they're up in space, astronauts still face everyday things like that unpleasant itching sensation on their faces. They can't just satisfy it while in their spacesuit. They need to improvise, so sometimes they scratch the spot with a microphone attached inside of their helmet. Sometimes they attach patches of Velcro inside their helmet for such things. One of the most complicated issues with space trips is how to protect astronauts from space radiation. Our body has not evolved to handle proton storms and cosmic rays coming from the sun. 
Of course, spacesuits and the rest of the equipment are essential. Some research also showed an antioxidant-rich diet that usually includes a bunch of vegetables like spinach, tomatoes, and beetroot is promising when it comes to reducing the bad effects of radiation. Astronauts didn't always wear white spacesuits. During NASA's first manned spaceflight project called Project Mercury, they had silver suits. But none of the astronauts went out and explored the vacuum of space back then. Silver is not a good color for that, because spacesuits have to be highly reflective. White is the best for that. That color is the most effective for reflecting radiation while in outer space. We're on Earth, which means the atmosphere is like a shield that protects us from 77% of radiation coming from the sun. But astronauts don't have such protection up there, and this means they're very vulnerable to severe sunburn and extremely high temperatures. A white spacesuit helps, the same way as white paint on your walls helps you keep an entire room cooler. A lighter color will absorb 35% less heat. White is not the only color in their closet. When heading into space or coming to Earth, they sometimes wear a bright orange suit. It's a color that attracts attention. So if anything goes wrong during landing and astronauts have to quickly leave their ship, the rescue crew will spot them more easily. But times are changing. So today, we have more sophisticated tools to locate astronauts that need help, such as GPS trackers and transponders, so suits don't have to be orange anymore. Floating through space, everything's peaceful and you're enjoying the magnificent view of the dark and quiet infinity filled with billions of stars, planets, comets, suns, moons, and so many other things we'll probably never even discover. 95% of our universe still remains a mystery to us. But at least the view is awesome. But it's only good if you're tethered. What if something goes wrong on your spacewalk and you detach? The whole scene goes from a beautiful dream to a nightmare in a second. But don't worry. NASA has designed a special jetpack called SAFER, Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue. It fires compressed nitrogen from 24 thrusters, which is how it can steer the astronaut back to safety. In theory, you could vent some gas from your suit too, or maybe throw a tool in the opposite direction, which is how you'll push yourself forward. But it's tricky because you'd need to throw it precisely in line with your center of mass. Otherwise, you'll just start uncontrollably spinning. And before you know it, you'll become so disoriented, you'll have no idea where to go, even if you could. But SAFER will automatically detect rotation and use its jets to help you stay oriented towards the safe spot. It took scientists 10 days to teach a goldfish to drive a car. They taught it to move its own tank towards a certain target. And in return, the fish gets a treat. This research could help us navigate through space one day. There has to be some mapping happening in our minds. That's how we potentially link our body parts and movements to changes we go through when we're in space. That's how we'll know how far we can extend our arm to reach for a cup of coffee without going too far and knocking the coffee over. The movement control is not the same as under the force of gravity. And we need to be sure if such maps in our brain differ between sea and land or if it's something universal. So when I say scientists taught a fish to drive, that basically means if the fish saw a target, it should touch the wall of the tank facing the desired direction. That way, scientists could guide the wheels and move them where the fish wanted to go. Behold the distant future. Yep, humans have successfully colonized Mars and the moon. Problems with overpopulation and hunger on Earth are solved. But soon, a new threat looms over our planet. Uh, excuse me, planets. And the moon. Anyway, scientists have figured out that in 150 years, the sun will explode and destroy our entire solar system. Bummer. There's enough time to build a fleet of huge spaceships and evacuate everyone. But it's not enough time to come up with some sort of sci-fi space jump. It's been a long time since people found a new, potentially livable planet, and the nearest one's a several million years ride away. There's no other choice. Humankind is evacuated into gargantuan spaceships, and the infinitely long voyage begins. A few decades pass, 
we leave the solar system and watch our sun explode. A huge flash and that's it. There's no more light. Just small, faraway stars and the infinite black depths of space. All ships are on a synced autopilot that won't go off course no matter what. Even if everyone on board were to disappear, the ship would still arrive at its destination. So, the upside, humans will survive for millions more years. The downside? Because of all of that time spent on space transports, we'll look different, totally different. Ships arriving to the new planet will be populated with shapeless, pulsating biomasses sitting inside metal exoskeletons. Here's how it happens. Bones in space get weaker, so do muscles. There's no gravity, so your body's not under any sort of pressure to keep it running properly. Astronauts on the International Space Station do a lot of exercise to stop their muscles from withering away. Ah, back to the story. There are gyms and special machines that recreate gravity on every space transport. But to save energy, they're only plugged in in a couple of hours per day. Unfortunately, no matter how hard people exercise, in space it just won't be enough. After the first hundred years, human bones have become so brittle that anything remotely physical can lead to injury. After another hundred years, people lose the ability to stand up on their two legs. But it's not only because of weak bones. After all those years in zero gravity, the human body's already changed a lot. A big problem is that people lose their sense of balance. If you try to stand up, you'll just fall. The ship's captains dismantled the gravity machines. They weren't working anyways. And all the sports equipment on board got taken apart ages ago and used as spare parts for the ships. The lack of gravity didn't just make people weaker. It also made them taller. The spine needs gravity to keep it stable. And now all those backbone discs have stretched themselves out. Humans are starting to look like blow-up toys. Everyone's given mechanical arms and legs. You just strap them on and get to work. Servicing the engine, cleaning out the bedrooms, throwing trash out into space, lifting anything. Not happening without those mechanical arms and legs. Time passes, and people become more helpless. Luckily, the mechanical bodysuits keep getting better and better. Since the sun collapsed in on itself, human eyes have been having a hard time. Inside the ships, the sun is replaced by special artificial light that also gives off vitamin D. Since there's way less light overall, people's pupils become wider. Then, after a few more centuries, their vision really starts going downhill. But this problem is solved by technology. Artificial lenses magnify light and keep humans from going completely blind. The ships get disinfected every single day. That stops bacteria and microbes from multiplying. But it also means that the human immune system doesn't have to fight off any diseases. Pretty soon, humans can't defend themselves against anything. Even a mild cold could be seriously harmful. It's fine for now. There are no germs or anything on board, but what's going to happen later on down the road? On the ship, millions of plants grow in special greenhouses with water and ultraviolet light. The plants produce oxygen and spread it through the entire ship. Of course, it's not enough oxygen to satisfy millions, but it helps people remember the planet they left behind. After centuries of living on spaceships, humans have adapted to the new conditions and almost stopped breathing. Lungs have disappeared almost completely, and humans are starting to develop other ways of getting oxygen. From water, from liquid oxygen tanks, we're becoming a totally new species. But it's not all bad. Genetic engineering is developing every year. Full-fledged life support suits are created. They help with movement, strength, speed, vision, hearing, even speech. People's voices get so weak they can only speak in whispers. Luckily, the suits have built-in microphones and speakers. There's no food anymore, just specially created liquids. After all that time in space, the human stomach can't digest anything anyway. Fancy a handful of peanuts or a small cracker? Forget it! In the beginning, the special space food had loads of flavor. But over time, people sort of forgot what things were supposed to taste like. Eventually, they stopped adding in flavorings, and because of this new tasteless food, tongue receptors stopped working. Soon, people lost all sense of taste. 
For some people, this life seems unbearable, but they have a choice. They can just slide on into a cryogenic capsule for millions of years. Then it's just a matter of a quick defrost when the ships finally arrive. But it's seriously risky to be frozen for such a long time. There's no guarantee that the ships won't crash into a huge meteorite, or worse. People start to take a different approach. They upload their consciousness to a central computer. It's safer and requires much less power. And when you wake up, you can just download your mind into a new, modified human suit. Some people decide to stay awake and live a, quote, normal life. Thousands of years pass, then millions. Humans look really different now. All their limbs are now artificial, and the exoskeletons they wear are controlled by mind power. With each passing millennium, arms, neck, legs, and spines, they become smaller and smaller. Brittle bones soon dissolve into nothingness. Eyes, nose, and mouths disappear. The brain isn't protected by a skull anymore, it's just surrounded by soft skin. Only consciousness remains. Nowadays, a human is a powerful high-tech robot ruled over by a small, pulsating bag filled with a brain. It's been a few million years since humans left Earth. All the ship's inhabitants have already forgotten that their species was born on a planet with gravity. The history of life on Earth has become a myth, an ancient legend. Most people believe that these ships are their true homes, always have been. That's why, when humans finally reach their destination, no one's that eager to get off and have a walk around. Life on a new, unknown planet seems like a huge pain in the spacesuit. Gravity, air, bacteria, germs… It takes several thousand years of evolution for humanity to get used to these new conditions. Luckily, humans have a secret weapon – technology. At this point, all humans are downloaded from the central computer into new robot suits. People face a choice – get off the ship and make this planet their new home, or stay and live on the ships. Those that stay on the ships set off into the expanses of space to explore the galaxy and discover new worlds. Those who decide to stay on the new planet have to adapt to the new conditions. It's pretty different from Earth. There's a different air density, different weather patterns, and strange new chemical elements. It will take another million years before these robo-brain sacs take on a new shape. One day, these distant human descendants will want to research their origins. They'll invent a ship that can jump through space and time. The research will lead them to the distant past, to the small planet Earth, to now. This might sound crazy, but just imagine that tomorrow someone lands in your backyard and they're your descendants from the future. Those passengers who stayed on the ships will probably find new planets and maybe decide to stay on some of them. Their bodies will change and adapt too. So in billions of years, the universe will be inhabited by different amazing creatures that all have something in common. They were all humans once. Okay, show of hands. Who still believes that the sun goes around the Earth? <laughs> Nobody. Oh, but everybody used to. It sure looks like it does. The sun comes up in the east, the sun goes down in the west. The sun comes up in the east again, so the sun goes around the Earth. It seems intuitively irrefutable. And it is so. But it's not true. The sun doesn't go around the Earth. Everybody knows that, but only now. So why do people still believe the moon goes around the Earth? It's not true either. We have to go back over 500 years to begin to get an idea of how hard it is for science to change universally accepted facts. Nicholas Copernicus, around 1510, was the first to propose a heliocentric, sun-centered solar system. But he didn't do it publicly. Copernicus privately circulated letters to other astronomers, explaining why the accepted fact of an Earth-centered solar system should be scrapped in favor of a more straightforward, more astronomically correct, sun-centered solar system. Copernicus's difficulty in promoting the sun-centered solar system depended on another bold conceptual innovation, that the Earth rotates. Copernicus's concept of a rotating Earth 
flew directly in the face of five literal statements in the Bible that the earth was founded on a fixed foundation never to be moved. And the Catholic Church wasn't about to let that worldview be challenged or changed. Copernicus had too much to lose to go public with his revolutionary, pun intended, heliocentric theory as a churchman himself. 100 years later, Galileo Galilei wasn't so reticent. Galileo had observational proof to back him up because he had a telescope. In early 1610, Galileo first observed the moons of Jupiter and kept track of their orbits. Yes, the moons of Jupiter do orbit around Jupiter. They go round and round the giant planet in actual orbits, unlike, as we shall soon see, how our moon travels around the sun with the Earth. Galileo became famous, or infamous, as the case may be, because he discovered orbital motions that were not heliocentric, that did not fit the accepted worldview. It rattled civilization's Earth-centered cosmology. Galileo was indeed revolutionary. Later in 1610, Galileo observed through his telescope, which only had an aperture of one and a half inches, the planet Venus going through phases, just like the moon goes through stages. Galileo wrote that Venus imitates the moon in Latin in his notebook. There could be no other explanation for these observations. Venus was orbiting the sun. People were afraid to look through Galileo's telescope when he set it up in the great square of Pisa. They were too scared to have their worldview revolutionized. Strange as it may seem, we are experiencing something similar to that now, concerning the moon orbiting the sun and acting like a double planet with Earth. People, scientists included, stubbornly persist in viewing the moon as its clever official International Astronomical Union name. It's a moon of the Earth, orbiting around the Earth, showing its different phases throughout the lunar month, or moonth, as moon fans sometimes like to call the 29 and a half day cycle of lunar phases. Moon lovers' favorite day of the week, of course, is Moon Day. It comes right after Sunday. But back to the science. It's how our school books portray the phases of the moon. It's what people believe now. Notice how the Earth is the moon's center, and how it goes around the Earth in a circular path. This is the geocentric view of the moon. It's what we see from Earth. The moon comes up, the moon goes down. The moon comes up again, the moon goes around the Earth. But that's not what's happening in space. It's way past time we Copernicus-size the moon. We need to start seeing the moon from a heliocentric point of view, as we do for everything else in the solar system. First of all, the geocentric view of the moon's phases shows the Earth stationary, sitting in the center of the moon's path for a whole moon, th a uh, month. But the Earth is not stationary at all. We're zooming around the sun at a very high speed anywhere between 66 and 68,000 miles an hour. Therefore, any picture of the moon going around a stationary Earth is profoundly misleading and really outright wrong. The heliocentric view of the Earth and moon moving together in space should look something like this. Notice that the moon is not going around the Earth. It's traveling along with the Earth, around the sun. The path of the moon around the sun is a sinusoidal path back and forth, back and forth, across the ever forward moving path of the Earth. Notice that the moon always goes forward too. It doesn't ever go backward to either the sun or the Earth. By always moving forward and sinusoidal, the path of the moon does not qualify as an orbit in the same sense that the other moons of the solar system orbit their planets in elliptical paths. Therefore, it is wrong to say the moon orbits the Earth. The moon orbits the sun along with the Earth, or the moon and the Earth both orbit the sun, are statements Copernicus and Galileo would approve of. But science today has difficulty accepting a heliocentric view of the moon. Maybe there would be too many books that need to be reprinted. Maybe too many astronomy professors would have to admit that they were wrong their whole careers. Accordingly, Objections are put forward to block the revolutionary heliocentric view of the moon from being universally accepted. One such objection is that the moon never leaves the Earth's gravity well, and therefore should be rightly considered a moon of the Earth, an orbital to use the astronomical term for satellite. Undoubtedly, the moon never leaves the Earth's gravity well, or else we would lose the moon. 
However, representations of this well-known definite fact always show the moon moving around the Earth inside the gravity well. And this is not true. The moon never goes back toward the Earth as it would need to if it were in an elliptical orbit. So the gravity well objection can be dismissed because the astronomers who propose as orbital evidence that the moon always stays within the Earth's gravity well fail or neglect to include the facts of the moon's continuously forward sinusoidal motion. Escape velocity for the moon to leave Earth's gravity well is reported to be about 2,684 miles per hour. Relative to the Earth, the moon presently moves about 2,238 miles per hour. What kind of impact would it take to accelerate the moon that extra 450 miles per hour needed to knock it out of Earth's gravity well? If anyone wants to compute that, you're most welcome to put your answer in the comments section. Maybe it could happen, and that would not be good. There's another objection to looking at the moon from a heliocentric point of view. And that involves the barycenter of the Earth-Moon system. The barycenter is the center of gravity between the Earth and the Moon. Think of yourself on a seesaw in the park. The other end of the seesaw is a massive lineman from a professional football team. How far forward towards you would the lineman have to move so that you both are balanced evenly? He'd have to move towards you almost to the center of the seesaw. You are the Moon and the lineman is the Earth. Although Earth is a feminine name. The balance point of the Earth-Moon system, the barycenter, is over 1,000 miles inside the Earth. It is this balance point, astronomers dutifully point out, that is orbiting the Sun. It is a heliocentric point of view. Copernicus and Galileo would approve. However, these astronomers always seem to add the geocentric animation of the Moon orbiting around the Earth, with the barycenter inside. In this way, they can keep the Moon orbiting around the Earth. But it's somewhat dishonest to combine two different perspectives in one animation. <laughs> you can't have your cake and eat it too. This leads us directly to the real sticking point that keeps us from believing that the Moon is orbiting the Sun, the double planet conundrum. The International Astronomy Union refuses to consider the Moon and Earth a double planet. They refuse to do so almost exclusively because the very center of the Earth-Moon system is inside the Earth. It's tough to buck City Hall, as the saying goes. You'll recall that IAU, or UAI if you use the French designation, demoted Pluto to dwarf planet status. And they still haven't reversed that decision, despite seemingly ample evidence that Pluto is the ninth planet. Perhaps we should reflect on what it means to be an Earthling. To be an Earthling implies that we know ourselves to be space-born people orbiting a yellowish star near the outskirts of a spiral galaxy. We, meaning all the peoples of Earth, live in space and are absolute creatures from space. Above us is the Moon, Earth's companion. We're making a big mistake by referencing the Moon according to our geocentric parameters. Our conceptual expansion into space is inhibited by an incorrect, outdated, Earth-bound view of the Moon. The universe doesn't revolve around us, and neither does the Moon. <laughs>